um, machine learning model, if you start formally learning about it, you'll find the first example they give you is house price predictions. And in fact, you'll see in uh, Visual Studio later that will get you to make something that predicts house prices. Um, so it's a single instance of you predicting the price of a house in the past, how right that was, uh, how wrong that was, etc. Then the features are the things about the house that has led the model to make a certain decision. So number of bedrooms, square footage, how nice the neighborhood is, that sort of thing. So uh, rather than, you might think, you can kind of think of them as parameters. So the things that you fire at the model to give it a prediction back. Uh, this is for supervised learning as well, by the way, in case anybody knows what unsupervised is versus supervised. Um, yeah, it's the, it's the features of the house um, that have led the model to make a certain prediction. Um, and then very quickly, we have discrete outputs and continuous outputs. So um, we are going to be doing a hot dog detector based on my favorite, uh, if, if you're a Silicon Valley fan. Uh, there's a really good scene in there where they make a hot dog detector and it's the most useless um, use for machine learning. So I thought, why not do a talk on it? Um, discrete outputs on the left hand side. Yeah, like I said, we're going to be doing a hot dog detector, which is discrete output. It's a hot dog or it's not a hot dog, zero or one. Continuous output is the house price prediction. So that's a, um, I don't know, yeah, a house price prediction can be any number between zero and silly numbers. So that's kind of an example of a continuous output. For discrete output, I guess you can think of like number of goals in a football game. It's kind of, it's got to be in a bucket. I guess with house prices, you can you can say it's between zero and 100,000. So you could do it like that if you prefer, um, but it depends on your use case. So linear regression, um, if you're not familiar with it, if you can reduce it down to a kind of one dimensional example, it's essentially making a line of best fit on a cluster diagram. So if all these clusters are uh, square footage of your house and the Y axis is the, the value of the house that it ended up being, the line of best fit is, I have a new house that I want to make a prediction for. It has this square footage, therefore I think it's gonna be this much house price. And it's about minimizing the vertical distance between the line and the areas. So the machine learning algorithm will solve, will find you that line of best fit essentially. So it will solve for, if you remember your GCSE maths, um, M and C, so Y equals MX plus C. Uh, important to note that it's not necessarily a straight line in this case. It could be a kind of exponential, which might be a good use case for this, or uh, I suppose a polynomial is a, a better way to refer to it as in that. Then the logistic regression, it's about drawing a line such that you've got the, the greens on one side and the blues on the other side. You'll get the odd green over here and you'll get the odd blue over there and those are false positives, false negatives. And this is, um, it's black and white or green and blue in this example. And it's about minimizing the how wrong it gets certain um, greens and blues. That's that. You can't draw a line of best fit for logistic regression models. Um, so they do something called the sigmoid curve. I think it's skipping really into the, into the nitty gritty sort of stuff. But if you imagine a line of best fit going all the way diagonally across this screen, if you have your line of best fits all the way over here, it's going to think that's very wrong if you had a point over here. And I think that another maybe classic example of logistic regression is maybe size of tumor versus it being cancerous or not. Um, so if you have a very, very large tumor over here, it's very likely to be cancerous, but your line of best fit is gonna say that's wrong because of the horizontal, the vertical distance between the line of best fit and the thing. So they do something called a sigmoid curve. And then if you have a size of a tumor and you come up to the line and back to the y-axis, this is one at the top and zero at the bottom. And like I said, because it's a discrete output, you can't have something in the middle that's either cancerous or not. Um, so that comes back to 97% and then it's up to you to decide 97% probably means it's going to be cancerous and maybe you decide it's 50% the threshold, it's 70% the threshold, kind of minimize your, your false positives, your false negatives, things like that. So enough of the maths lesson, this is ML.net specifically. So it hasn't been along for, uh, hasn't been around for a while. Um, we have been able at my current place of work to use this in a production environment, which is pretty cool. Um, so we were kind of hot on the heels of that getting released and then just, we in fact prototyped it in um, Python and then ML.net came along and we're like, let's do it in ML.net if it's here, if the prototype, if we can recreate the prototype and it performs as well. Um, and this is on their main website, so it won't take you long. If you look into ML.net, 
they'll um, start singing and dancing about a specific use case where they've done some sentiment analysis of Amazon review data. If you're not sure what sentiment analysis is, it's essentially text analysis and trying to determine if a review is good or bad. Um, so in their in ML.net, 93% of the time it was able to determine whether a review was good or bad. And then I guess the smaller bar is better here um, because it's the amount of time it took to train and test the model. So it, um, Visual Studio has this cool thing that we'll use today um, for uh, building your own model, so a kind of interface to uh, define your data and, and things like that. It's in .NET, it's cross-platform. Cross um, we'll use the model builder GUI uh, this evening, and then I can't speak to how good the CLI is for Mac or Linux, but it exists, so you can do it uh, if you're not on Windows in your day-to-day. -day. And what's quite cool about it is you can do it uh, on Azure or you can deploy it on-prem. So if training your model takes a lot of firepower from like a RAM or a CPU perspective, you can train your model on Azure and kind of let that do the heavy lifting and you can just watch it. So the hot dog predictor, essentially we're going to be taking, a, not taking a photo, we'll be sending a photo, uh, firing it at a, a, an ABI which has the hosted model that we're going to train on it. Uh, we'll be running locally for all of this as we're going to be building it and testing it as we go. And it's going to spit out whether it thinks it's a hot dog or not. Um, so, if anything, it's just going to kill a few minutes by watching the Silicon Valley scene. So that Please, God. What would you say if I told you there is an apple on the market? If anything, it's just killed me, I'll see. Um, we're going to be making that um, my favorite ever machine learning model. Um, so if I kill. Apologies. So we're in Visual Studio now. So as warned, there is a um, model build builder uh, GUI, or I don't know if you say GUI, um, to help you build your machine learning model. I have some sample data. I have photos of things that are not hot dogs, or not hot dogs, um, and I have some photos of things that are hot dogs. It would be very, very easy for me to make a pizza folder or a burger folder, etc., etc. So hopefully, you see that's not kind of the point. We're kind of doing ones or zeros, and I could make a very much less interesting topic. But um, yes, and lots of images, lots of um, what you call them, stock images of, of hot dogs on the interwebs as well. Um, so that, that's my training set. So each, as I, I was talking about training examples earlier, uh, that's a training example, that's a training example, uh, things like that. And then I, um, crucially, I've got some samples that I'm going to use to test this model with things that are either hot dogs or not. And crucially, they're not in the test set. Um, so we can see how it performs with un, previously unseen data. And then we'll see that, I think, a, yeah, we'll, we'll see later that this is not a hot dog, um, but the model does, you can see why a model might think that's a hot dog, uh, especially when you only train it on 20 photos. Um, so we'll kind of do a bit of kind of continuous improvement of the model there and kind of retrain it. So it's really quick to build your own model. And even in the models that we have deployed into production, we've always started in this way. So it's not a kind of patronizing sandbox for building ML models to learn about ML.net. It's actually been my starting point every time I've ended up doing this in my day job. Um, and I don't think I emphasize that quite enough. It's as simple as, um, you know, in the Visual Studio install, you tick your optional, your optional stuff, you tick the machine learning library, and that gives you this option to create a new machine learning model on my just blank console app. I just created an empty one that says hello world um, in that minimal API way, or however that works. Um, 
and it gives you loads of templates to choose from. Um, so hopefully um, you've assumed that we're going to be doing image classification this evening. Um, and it says two plus categories, so it needs a minimum of two. Our categories are hot dog and not hot dog. Um, value prediction, as I warned, it's talking about predicting house prices, just because it's the easiest thing to kind of explain. Um, data classification is just like image classification, but rather than firing images at it, it's firing uh, text data or JSON data or, or things like that. Um, recommendations, object detection, so pretty much all the sort of classic examples of using machine learning, you'll be able to kind of do a, uh, something in Visual Studio for it. Um, and then we have anomaly detection and clustering. Clustering is an example of unsupervised learning, uh, so you can do that as well. Um, with image classification, as you can see, you can do on Azure and on local. Uh, I'm going to be doing local because, like I said, I've only got 20, 20 photos. But, like I said, if you wanted to train in Azure, you can absolutely do that. I assume it's expensive, but <laughs> uh, you can find out for yourself. So I'll be training locally, and then you need to select a folder such that the subdirectories are your categories. And as you can see, we've got all of my uh, stock photos of hot dogs, and then I'm not hot dogs. I've got all my not hot dogs. There's 54 images, images in total. This is the bit which takes 30 seconds or so. Um, so this is the, the black box, I guess you could consider it as. It knows that I'm doing image classification. It has my data. And what it's doing is it's trying out its the industry standard algorithm to see which one performs best against its test set. And it will be logging things out to the console saying, I'm trying this algorithm, I'm trying that algorithm, this one works this well, this one works that well. With this specific example, the first thing it tries works 100% of the time. And I think that's probably because I'm using 20 photos. So it just, if, <laughs> if I had 100 photos, this might take five minutes. So purposes of the talk, something that's quite easy. It's got 100% accuracy, which is 1.000 is. The model that's selected is this DNN plus ResNet 60. I don't know what that is, but it's one of the algorithms that it tries to see how it does against the training sets. Um, and it only explores one model because it found one that worked perfectly, so why train more? Then it generates some code for you. Now, the code it generates is not production ready, uh, but it generates the code that has being used to create this model, uh, and then your next step is to kind of refactor it off and make it nice. Get your message on the screen that says no operation off two minutes. You should the remote one. Oh, on the screen. Thank you. Right, hopefully that will Everyone would just turn around and watch that TV then, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then evaluate. So, I, I guess test your model. Um, let's use. Let's mark our own homework and use a hot dog that I trained the model on. Um, and as you can see, it thinks this photo of a hot dog. Once you count the bits, is a hot dog. Uh, and then conversely, let's pick something that's not a hot dog. And it will think it's not a hot dog. And I can be reasonably confident in that because it said that the model accuracy was 100%, so I can be sure that it got all my first examples right. Um, in terms of if, if you are familiar with machine learning, there's concepts like cross-validation and things like that, and having a training set and a test set and things like that. It's probably out of scope for this talk, but that's something that you can consider doing if you wanted to make your model kind of more robust in a production environment. Uh, and then in ML.NET version 1, it just spat out a console app. So what this is doing is asking, we can generate loads of code for you. What do you want that code to look like? You can create a console app. Um, which is what it was doing in version one. And then recently, this really handy thing is they've made a web API that consumes your model. So it spits out something with Swagger enabled and all that sort of stuff. So you can just go fire an image at it and it says a one or a zero or whatever. Um, I can't speak to the notebook, um, but uh, that's a third option if you know what notebook editor is. I'm going to add this web API to my uh, solution. I'm going to call it hot dog detector.api. And it spits out a .NET 6 uh, minimal API, um, which I think the next talk's on, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, should have mentioned next month's talk is by Kevin on uh, minimal APIs. Well, we, like, don't, we don't need to now, because I'm not on the website. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. 
Um, so it's about all sorts of code. Um, the, like I said, really usefully, it's given me a Endpoints API Explorer using Swagger, giving me Swagger JSON and things like that. So if I run that, um, Oh, it's because it's my console. That's why. So it's given me a single endpoint of forward slash predicts, and that's a post method. And I post a, um, I don't know, do forward slash swagger. So without writing any code, I can go to this thing and I can give it a, you know, CI thing. Can you make that just a tad bigger? Yeah, of course. Is that all right? Um, you know, sleep slash images, etc. Um, I don't find that super useful. I'd rather select something from a file picker and send it off or take a photo or whatever. Um, so what I've done um, before is I've just made a really tiny Angular app that makes me select an image and then I send it off to the API and do that. But I do need to make some changes to the API to allow me to do that. Um, I'm going to whiz through this. Oh, don't Um, sorry about that. Um, I need to make some changes to my API to allow me to accept a file back. I'm going to whiz through this because it's uh, you know not really what we talked about. Um, so I need to add calls to allow the Angular app to do it. I need to use calls to allow any origin. This is fine. Um, I am then going to accept a form file uh, in my predict endpoint. I'm going to get a file from the request form rather than posting an image at. I'm going to get it from the uh, request, and that way I can accept a HTTP request in my method. And finally, do the stream to a row there. Sorry, this is a bit clunky, but um, let me see. So that's what that's doing. Um, that now accepts uh, the HTTPS. We'll find out shortly if that works. If it doesn't work, I'll just undo my pending changes in, in source tree and then it will work. So in my, back in my Angular app, I select an image. I, I think I'll need to change the call very quickly. Um, so we are running out. 52313. Coming back here. Just change that quickly. I'll explain what it's doing under the hood as well. So I've just found another photo, and like I said, it's not in the training set this is a new one the things that previously unseen thing is a hot dog um, and if I remember correctly it doesn't think Kermit hot, the frog's a hot dog um, let's go into what that's actually doing behind the scenes there that's all kind of well and good and shiny but um, the important bit of code is this add prediction engine call maybe if it works here yeah, sure can everyone see the lights on yes um, yes, we'll add the prediction engine pool. That allows me to dependency inject this prediction engine pool here. And what that does is it takes a model input and uh, returns a model output. Um, and it does prompt files. So um, I'll stop running this and I'll show you the code that it's actually generated now. So ml model dot, ml model one dot zip is the model. So it's a zip file containing, I don't know what's in the zip file, I haven't unzipped it, um, but it is the machine learning model, it's the trained model. That file can be placed on your on-premise server if you want to use it in a production environment, it can be put in Azure Blob Storage, whatever. Um, but yeah, that is your um, trained model. Uh, from file, there's also from URI, so you can specify a URL where the model lives and things like that, so it's not just from a file. Do you know, uh, do you know what format the 
model that it produces? Uh, no, uh, in terms of the algorithms used or the, the file format. Yeah, the file format, because there are standard machine learning formats. That oh, are around, is it? That's useful. That might be interesting. So the ML model is it. Right. Is that the joke matter? You need to, I think you need to go into training and conversion. Transform the chain. Oh, wrong word. Ah. <laughs> Apologies. It's magic from my perspective. Magic. Um, so the yes, that's what the training model is. It's there, uh, dumped in my solution. Um, and then we have two kind of partial C sharp classes. This is when you want to start doing your refactoring, but it um, puts your model input here and it takes in a label. So it thinks it's a hot dog, thinks it's not a hot dog. Not thinks it is, you know it's a hot dog because it's supervised learning this. And then a byte array for the image source stays in your, uh, what's turned into your features of the model. Um, and then for new stuff, it doesn't have a label because we don't know what it should be and it, it's kind of like an optional column. Um, and then what it does is it takes one of these and the prediction engine spits out one of these, um, which is uh, int label. I think hot dog is uh, it's kind of uh, indexed. Um, so it's signed in, so it goes zero is hot dog and one is not hot dog, which is a little bit counterintuitive because we're talking about positive negatives, ones and zeros, but um, that's fine. Uh, it returns the image source back to you um, in case you find that useful. The predicted label, which is essentially the string of the, the um, hot dog and not hot dog. And then an array of scores, and like I said, because it's two plus categories, it gives you an array, so it gives you, um, because we have two categories, it's an array of length two, and the first is the uh, number between zero and one, how much it thinks it's a hot dog, the second one's the number between zero and one, how much it thinks it's not a hot dog. Um, and then we have um, ML model one does it, the prediction engine is kind of lazy loaded if you just want to call, um, if you just have a model input and just want to predict it, um, that allows you to do that as well. So you can kind of construct a model input yourself and do a dot predict. Um, and what that does is uh, doing the lazily initialized prediction engine here um, will do dot value. But the um, the API, the thing that's injected into my post method, isn't the same as this. And then it creates the prediction engine as well, and it loads. So uh, to do anything in ML, dot there are context. Uh, it will load it from that zip file path, uh, and then just a bit of the API allows you to create a prediction engine from that, which takes model input and turns it into a model output. And so that's the consumption, i.e. how it behaves, and then this is how it was trained. So everything we've done so far, and everything you can do in the model builder, you can write in code as well. So if you get really familiar with ML.net, you can just make this from scratch, and this is this is exactly how it has trained it, and it's very, very simple. It does a multi-class classification um, on image classification, label column names. You can do all sorts of stuff. It uses this kind of uh, builder pattern in case you want to append any more pipeline things. Uh, for example, if you want to do some feature normalization or things like that, you can do that as part of your uh, machine learning pipeline. Um, the machine learning model is an I transformer. Um, so pipeline dot fit here when you're retraining the pipeline. As you can see, this calls this method down here, builds a pipeline and then fits to the training data. So think of that as a the data view is just my collection of images that I'm retraining the model on. So is that code you've written or is that boilerplate code the model has for you? This is all model generated. Right. Okay. Uh, so the only code I've written was this console app at the start. Uh, and then this for this this C sharp project. So the plugin does everything for you, really. Exactly, and like I said, you you might want to refactor this and make it kind of production ready afterwards, and, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, brilliant. Um, so that's the code that it generates, and like I said, we've got the minimal API here, um, and we have shown it getting some things right, some things wrong. As I warned earlier. Um, this is an image that you could see why on not many training examples a model might think that that is a hot dog. 
for the API to come back. I know we're in my API, that would be why. So it thinks that's a hot dog. It's got like an oval shaped thing of, that it thinks is a sausage and then, you know, buns either side, that sort of thing. So it's not a, it's not a stupid model. It just hasn't been given enough data to train on. Um, that's the best thing about doing machine learning. There's no such thing as bugs. It's just bad models. Um, let's try Mo Salah. I think it thinks, yeah, it thinks Mo Salah is a hot dog as well. So we need to retrain our model. And for these, we need to, we have, yeah, let's say we trained our model, we put it in production, and users have reported it thinks Mo Salah is a hot dog. Um, so we want to retrain our model. Um, but we're not going to use the model builder again. I'll show you how we can do this in code as well, um, which is quite simple. And then essentially, I think what I'll do is I'll grab this method. So I add a new method called retrain to my info. You might want to do this in certain specific ways, um, but I'm just going to add a new endpoint that I can call in Slacker. So now this is worth going through the code here. Um, apologies for this horribleness, but um, what I'm doing here is I'm iterating through all the things it finds in the hot dog folder, all the things that it finds in the hot, not hot dog folder, and makes one big list of training examples um, of my model input there. Um, then with this list of training, so you can kind of just, that's kind of the point of my code here. I'm just making a list of things, um, and the labels are hot dogs and hot dogs. The hot dogs are not hot dogs. Um, I also need to write a kind of really horrible lack of code because of partial classes. And say M on model two equals M on model one. Um, and then M on model two dot retrain pipeline. So the I have my training examples. I have my ML concepts. That's something that's in the machine learning library. Um, and then context of data, I need an iData view. This, I'm not sure if you can see how small that is. That's an iData view there, um, just to be explicit. iData view. And as we saw earlier, this data in an iData view, and that can be anything, but for, for this, it's, uh, it's images. You can load from enumerable, you can load from SQL, you can load from uh, URI, you can do all sorts of things to get your, your I kind of data view uh, like that. And you can also do a thing called training and testing split. If you want to split 80% off into your training set, 20% off into your testing set. Um, and then it will do the retrain pipeline. So do that and then call pipeline.bit. That's a thing which takes the 30 seconds um, and it's fitting it to the transformer, then it returns something that can be saved. Could you not train it for longer? Why would you if it's perfect? Um, well, it, it wasn't perfect. <laughs> it was perfect on my check on my test set. Thirty seconds seems it, very low. Yeah, that's because I've got twenty examples. It's learned all it needs to know from those twenty examples. Okay, uh, if I, like I said, if I had hundreds and hundreds of images, it would take a lot longer. Um, but there's no point in it. Like I said, it's like what you need to know, it doesn't need to spend any more time looking at the data. It's perfect on the training set. But like I said, in future, you can start thinking about cross-validating and having a testing set and all that sort of stuff. You're never going to get something that's perfect every time. Um, if you, if there's that American sitcom where is it cake or not, you can, something that thinks it's a hot dog is not actually a hot dog, but that's just an optical illusion rather than anything scientific. Um, so in, sorry, yeah. in, in this instance, um, so where we have the example where Mo Salah it said, oh, I think Mo Salah's a hot dog, but yeah. um, it, it's clearly not. In, in the retrain example, would you just take the image of Mo Salah and add it to the no hot dogs folder? And, and, and yeah, exactly. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gonna do now. Okay. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> I get my data. So, I'm gonna do exactly that, and I'm gonna get Mo Salah here, and the one that look, kind of looks like a hot dog and paste them into my not hot dogs folder. That way when I retrain the model, it trains with a different data set. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's that endpoint. I'm just gonna check everything's 
All good. It's all on that. So it kind of looks like 65% sure that my cells are the last time. So if we apply that again, oh, I need to retrain the pipeline. So this will still be 65% sure. <laughs> I'll actually break my notes because it might be useful to just kind of go through and then maybe put it after the hold. So I've got my new endpoint here to retrain. It doesn't take any parameters, so I can just execute it. I, I used to have 19 not hot dogs, but I've added two to it, so you can see there's 21 not hot dog file names. Um, and then I'm going to load that from the enumerable and create this high data view. And then if I step into retraining the pipeline, build the pipelines really fast, but it's this bit, which is going to take a while. And yeah, I think it took about 30 seconds last time, so I don't expect this. It's really a data science joke. Yeah. Red 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 red. About 30 seconds where stuff is happening in the background. <laughs> Cool. So that's given me a model, it's given me an eye transformer. And then, so it's done that. And then I can, on my thing, I can save the model, save this transformer with the schema of my image data, which just kind of needs to know what format the data's in. And then to that ML model one zip file. So if I go to my ML model in the API. As you can see, that's just been changed now, this minute, because uh, I've retrained it. So the zip file's been saved again, it's the new version. So that's all still running. So we load this. And because now most others in my not hot dog folder, it will think most other is not a hot dog. I'm very sure that my child's not a hot dog, which is great. And then similarly, it thinks that's not, even though it kind of looks like a hot dog, uh, it now thinks that's not a hot dog. Um, so that's an example of yeah, how you can retrain your model if you have new information in future. Uh, we've also done it in code rather than doing it for the model builder again. So if you think about if you want to put this into production, if we if you have the C sharp code, you can create scheduled task and jira functions to kind of retrain your model on this new data set. Um, sometimes you can retrain your model and it's worse than your previous model, so having some sort of persistence of how well the model does and then only saving your model, because what I'm doing here is I'm saving my model always. I think I should probably, if I would take this a step further, I'd probably check if it's better than the previous model before I save it because I could have removed five images from the not hot dog file and then lost my perfect model. Um, so that's that. Uh, any questions on that? I'm going to flip back to the PowerPoint now. You know when you said there's a CLI? Mm -hmm. you know, stuff as well, so you can do other filtering as well. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, like I haven't used it myself, but I think everything that you can do in terms of commands, you can do in the, in the CLI. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, um, if people know what a... What is the rules? People know what a learning curve is, uh, if they've come across machine learning sort of stuff before. Uh, I'm just going to kind of quickly define this before I get on to my last point, which is kind of top tips for putting these sort of things in production. Because it's very, the code it generates not, uh, it's not incredible, but it's very useful and it shows you how to do it, but it's not quite production ready at that point. Um, yeah, so a, a learning curve graph is how many training examples you need to train your model. So. Um, can you see my mouse? No, you can't. Um, so as you can see, we're kind of we're close to 100 at a sort of this sort of point. So the the point of a learning curve graph is you want to know how many training examples your model needs to be good. Why would you spend time collating more training examples? Why would you spend time training your model on this number when this number does just as well? So it's kind of more a sort of scalability concern, really. So if you establish a learning curve, and what this has done 
is it's trained the model with 20 examples, it's trained the model with 60 examples, trained it and so on and so on, and it's evaluated how it's done on that thing. So it's just how many training examples it needs to be good, um, which is quite time consuming, but very useful because we had a, and it's sometimes quite surprising how little training examples machine learning models need. You think you need millions and millions, but uh, in, in practice it's, uh, well, I've always been kind of pleasantly surprised. And I say pleasantly because you're not having to pull millions of records into memory and, and kind of doing things that's kind of a bit more scary than, you know, we thought we needed about um, 100,000 kind of six figures of training examples to train our model. We did a learning curve as we thought it was, and it said, I'm not getting any better and I've just trained you 4,000 training examples. So that's kind of, you know, a fraction of the cost and therefore will take a fraction of the time to kind of train and deploy and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's why doing a learning curve is very important and very useful. So yeah, um, like I said, we, we've kind of been hot on the heels of ML.net and we've managed to get something new going to live. We've had um, some learning experiences from that, naturally. So retraining periodically, you don't want to just train the model, put the zip file on the server and just leave it there forever. The data changes, hot dogs start to look different. They don't, but you know, in, 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 that, in other real life scenarios, you might, you might find that other positive cases. New things come along, like Mo Salah, uh, and you need to retrain your model. Um, investigate your false positives and negatives to make your model more robust. So, um, just like we did with that photo that we thought was hot dog, but it wasn't, we went into it and we put it into our training set. So that was one outcome of the false positives and negatives. But what it also, what you also might find is that, um, so let's say it thought something. If I take it back to the house prices analogy and house price predictions, um, let's say you're only taking into account square footage and number of bedrooms in order to predict a house price, um, and you get a house price prediction very, very wrong. So that's kind of like a false, a, a big error result. Um, so you then go, okay, why did that? Why was that house price so wrong? Uh, it turns out it was in a really bad neighbourhood. So you then have learned that maybe the model needs to start taking that into account. So really drilling into why things were wrong and kind of analyzing on a, analyzing on a kind of per training example basis, what went wrong, why was it wrong? It's because it was a Wednesday, that sort of arbitrary thing. It might seem arbitrary, but it turns out the model thinks it's quite important. Start adding then those new features to your model, start collecting that data and retrain the model with that and see if it uh, performs better in the future. Permutation feature importance, uh, or PFI, is something that Microsoft have on their website and shows you how to do it in ML.net. What it does is it ranks all your features. So uh, again, forgetting about the image classification because we haven't really talked about specific features of that with the house price prediction. Um, it, it orders the features by how important the model it is. And what it does is it trains the model lots of times without those features and analyzes how much worse that model is now. So if it doesn't train it without the square footage, it performs 20% worse. It goes, okay, the square footage has a massive impact on my model. And the reason why that's useful is because um, you're, as a human, you can kind of learn from machine learning models as well as you know the other way around that we're talking about tonight. Humans can learn from their machine learning models and they can find that square footage is you know, not very important at all. Why are we spending all that time and resource training that data when we could just not train that data and it performs just as well. And then conversely, you go, oh, it's really important that the square footage is really, really accurate, so we're gonna invest more money and time into making sure that's perfect as well. Establishing a learning curve, um, like I said, um, you don't want to train an unnecessary amount of examples. Um, your scheduled task could take a fraction of the time that it is currently doing if you knew how many training examples it took to be good. And then beta users, so uh, we use, um, we've come across uh, ASP.NET's feature flags functionality. We use that to switch on machine learning models for specific users, kind of like stakeholders in the, in the kind of bolt-on module that we're doing in the project. And the reason why we thought that was useful is because I think users <coughs> inherently aren't very trust, trustworthy of AI and they're kind of suspicious of it a little bit. So they need to be kind of um, bought into it, they need to be kind of brought around to it. We don't just want to switch it on for everyone and go, you, you, you're having this AI. We want to switch it on for a couple of people that are interested and want to learn more. 
um, and I guess stakeholders in the module, and then once they get a sort of like sneak preview into it, and they say, yeah, this is actually working well, it's having value, switching on for everyone or for more users, etc., etc. So that's why having it in .NET is really useful because of the retrain periodically. You can have Azure function on a timer, um, all that sort of stuff. So it's all the stuff that you're useful to, and it should seem like it makes sense to you. So that's pretty much it. Um, so the um, today's code is on my personal GitHub, uh, in case you uh, just wanted to pull that down and have, have a play. Um, the ML.net homepage, where you've got all those stats about the sentiment analysis uh, learning model, is there. And then my company's blog, which uh, is littered with my ramblings on ML.net, Google articles, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and you can find a post on ML.net and goes a bit further into what the API is and what it delivers and things like that. Uh, so unless anyone has any questions. Can we swap over whilst we're doing questions? Yeah, sure. Would that be right? um, so when, when you retrain your model, yeah. um, is there any difference between retraining the model and initial training other than the data? No, there's no difference. It's, it's running that code that it's generated. Um, so if we call that retrain endpoint, uh, I don't think we did that. Maybe I should have illustrated that point. We called that retrain endpoint. It still would have thought most other than 65% of the So it would have been exactly the same sort of performance. So let's like, say, so does retraining a model actually destroy the model some, and reconstruct The destruction of the model is when I call context.save. Um, so that model is the, the zip file, and then because um, it's just a file on my machine. Um, yeah, so the, the retrain happens when I've replaced that zip file. Oh, okay, so it's got written from scratch. Kind of. Yeah, you've got that zip file, and you might want to just see if that's a good model or a bad model, and then decide to save conditionally. Oh. Um, yeah. So is, is there a way to sort of incrementally adjust the model? So say you've retrained on the initial data set, and then yeah. it shows some picture and says it's a hot dog and it's not, and then click the button and say it's not a hot dog, and that will, would you need to then put that in the folder and then completely retrain the model? Or no, that's, that's really interesting, and it, it kind of, um, this specific use case, yes, that's how it would have to work, but if you did something with a SQL database or something, put a zip flag on it and say, yes, this is a training tablet, it's a one, therefore you can go find that. You can see how you could have um, quite easily a user kind of feedback if I say, yes, that is a hot dog, or it's not a hot dog, but the model thinks it is. I'll go save that information somewhere, you press retrain, and then it will get the data rather than from my local directory. And there was your box storage where all the country We still have to go to all of the data. Yeah, if you retrain, you can detect all the data. Yeah, that's a pretty idea. But every time you want to retrain, you get all of the data. Because uh, as far as I know, you can't do kind of go to the right folders. Um, so it's, it's why it's a good idea to do that sort of API. Can I ask you, I know you made an interesting point about there's, there's no such thing as bugs in, uh -huh. in the model, just, just bad data sets or yeah. et cetera. In the, like, in the estate agent example, if I came along and gave you all the data from my house, yeah. and it said, oh, it's, it's worth 100,000, I'm going, hang on, I think it's you know worth more. Yeah. Is there any way to sort of reverse engineer it to say, um, you know, why, is, why is my house only worth uh, that's interesting. I think a, a human expert at that point would have to say um, the model, the human expert would have to know what the model is taking into account okay. and then say the model isn't taking into account crime rates in the neighborhood okay. or something like that. So that's a good way. You could use the permutation feature in for instance. Uh, and then with linear regression, I was talking about y equals nx plus c. Mm -hmm. um, if you know that the square footage is really important, the permutation feature importance, you could, that's an element of reverse engineering because it kind of, it's called model explainability. Okay. It explains yeah. how, how well the model is doing and how it kind of behaves in a kind of work. So, um, yeah, that's probably the right approach there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, I'm going to do a talk now that is completely complementary to, hopefully, uh, complementary to Owen's excellent talk. Thank you, Owen. Welcome. Um, so, I'm going to present a different set of tools that do a fairly similar job, maybe from different perspectives. Um, so the data science process, uh, again, I'm looking at object detection. I'm going to use a set of tools, a website called uh, Edge Impulse. And the, the process pretty much follows uh, identical steps. You, you link a device, 
have a way of capturing data which you then go train against. You choose and then refine the model and then you deploy the model to something that's going to detect your, um, your item. Now, uh, I thought I was going to do hot dogs and burgers, but I'm a vegetarian, so we're going to do apples and fruit in this demo, and we will do a live demo at the end, so hopefully it'll work out, fingers crossed. Um, so on the, on the website, you set up the type of project. Here, you can do something based on accelerometer or audio, so you know, if you want to do a model about detecting whistles or barking in the air, you can do that kind of thing. Um, we're just going to do um, image detection and classify uh, uh, multiple objects. So does this object appear in the frame or not? Um, and we want to collect some data. So in Owen's example, he had some pre-prepared data. Um, you can upload it from your computer. Uh, you can get it from the cloud. Uh, multiple different uh, ways of getting the data, but I'm going to use my mobile phone. Um, so you click on that button and you get a QR code, which looks like that. So this is the website, I'm going to connect to a new device, show the QR code, scan here, open link. So it's just connected, so I've now connected to my, my project that is used to cla classify fruit, and I click collecting images. Uh, permission required, give access to camera. Okay, so I've got camera view there. So I'm going to capture some source data. I'm going around the apple, taking pictures of the apple from a variety of angles. So now my um, data appears here. So you can see my three unclassified pictures here. If I click on that, I can see I've taken a picture of an apple. These are uh, pictures that have already been classified here. So if I click on this one, you can see that I've classified several objects in here, and I've got three apples and one pear. So slightly different uh, supervised learning model. I'm dragging a box around the object I'm interested in, saying this is the model you need to learn. Uh, yeah, so you need, you need roughly 34, 30 to 40 different pictures from a variety of different angles. So this is my original source data set that I've trained my model on. Um, and as I'm using the camera, it automatically splits my data into uh, train and test data. So you do classification on both. So you say this is an apple, this is a pear, whatever. But it splits up 20% to test the model. And that's how you get these model efficiency at the end. So it looks like that, so I, I'm literally presented with uh, pictures and I drag the boxes around and I type in a bit of text, so banana, apple, pear. And then I set up my, uh, my training model. So it starts off with just this um, image block here and you say what, what size I'm going to standardize all the images to. You can have pre-processing steps uh, and this is the transfer learning model. So with neural networks, it, it says you need you know, hundreds of hours and millions of pictures to train it properly, but these are doing something called transfer learning. You're taking something that is already really good at object detection and then just building a bit more functionality onto it to say, uh, yeah, this is what I'm really interested in. So it takes a much shorter period of time to train the model. Uh, and then I'm spitting out the output. So we've got three outputs here, apple, pear, banana. Um, and then you can do something called generate features, and this is a good indication of how good your model is going to be. So what you need, really, is three discrete sets of, sets of blobs. So here it looks like banana is really well defined. It sits in its own cluster here. Apples are a bit more spread out. Don't know what happened to that banana over there. A bit of an outlier. And then I've got two pairs, which uh, are very similar to apples. So you think, well, the model this is going to generate is going to be good at picking up bananas and apples, but maybe not to pairs. So we're a bit confused there. So then you set um, the number of training cycles. And I think this is where the two different approaches is quite different, because um, in Edge Impulse, you can select the number of training cycles. So it defaults to 60, um, uh, but I've set it to 252, which is the absolute maximum I can get. 20 minutes. So I'm on the free version of Edge Impulse, so I get 20 minutes of free compute. 
and then it says, no, you need to pay for an enterprise license. Mm. Um, and the more training cycles you get, the better it is at doing predictions. Um, and then you wait 20 minutes. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Definitely don't press the button. And out of it, you get an F1 score. So uh, an F1 score is, is a complicated mathematical formula has uh, a function of positive positives, false positives, um, false negatives, and true negatives. So it's basically um, a percentage indicates how good your model is. 57% is okay, not brilliant. And then you get a confusion matrix. So you said, well, if I provide you a background, can you identify a background properly? So I told it what a background would look like because it was not true. So you can identify the background 100% of the time. That's good. What about apple? If I give it an apple, how, how often do I think it looks like background and how often do I think an apple is actually fruit? 83% of the time, really good. What about bananas? Oh, it, it's really bad at predicting bananas. It, so it thinks banana, it can't tell the difference between bananas and background. 100% of the time, really bad. Pear occasionally gets the pear right. So that's interesting. So looking back on our uh, feature matrix there, you'd expect it to be good at pre predicting bananas and apples, but not so much pears. But the confusion matrix tells us uh, you know, the true uh, indication of how good it's going to be. So inferencing time, so it's going to take about one second to do that inferencing. So if you're really performance uh, focused, um, then these statistics are going to be useful to you. So, the, I mean, this is all, a lot of the Agile Pulse data, uh, tool set is around embedded devices. So people are running on embedded devices. These are really important statistics, how much memory it's using, how much flash it's using, because you're in a really very small compute engine there. Um, yeah, and training length versus performance. So the number of training cycles, uh, the F score, F1 score, and then the time. So 60 training cycles took about five minutes and I got zero percent. It, it can identify absolutely nothing. It, this is a rubbish model. 130 training cycles, it got F1 score of 26.7% in 10 minutes, and then I got it up to 57.1 in 20 minutes. So you expect the longer training method uh, number of cycles that I give it, the better it's going to be at predicting stuff and identifying stuff correctly. Um, and you can de then deploy the model. Um, so bear, bear in mind we've not done any code so far, this has all been in the website. So we've created the model and then we can identify things with it. Uh, so yeah, I'll go through different types of deployment you can do, let alone embedded devices here, but I'm going to do this live computer demo here. So computer build, and it's going to run in my browser. Can we see that permission client? Yes, give access to camera. Did I sacrifice enough goats to the demo gods today? Yes, <laughs> Apple correctly identified. There you go, look at that, people. We are doing machine learning. I'm not an apple, happy. There you go. So uh, you can go to deploy it to mining board. So I've had this working on a Raspberry Pi uh, with a camera attached and it, uh, it just spits out a continuous stream of uh, apple, not apple. Uh, all sorts of other embedded devices. WebAssembly, C Sharp, C++ library, uh, TensorFlow, which is where we can link it in with ML.net, um, and all sorts of different uh, this is why I asked what format did you run? Yeah. Okay, and I think. Uh, yeah, so we've got the inferencing. Show it. Is that, oh, it works the same on mobile phone as well. And we can do the, the deployments. And yeah, if you speak about TensorFlow, then in ML, yeah, you can use Microsoft for ML or TensorFlow. So we showed that data is easy to capture. Um, we can put, identify our features using the web interface that we're interested in. We can train the model. Training a model using transfer learning reduces the uh, training time substantially, but the longer you train it for, the better the model you're going to get out of it. Um, and then the result model can be used in a number of different locations, including ML.net, mobile phone, Arduino, you, know, you name it. 
Quite snazzy place. Um, yeah, so he's done that again. Okay, so that was it. We're going to come back up and we'll field questions. Sure. There are any more questions? Yeah, can I yeah. fire one in? It looks like the, the training process is very sort of compute in, intensive. Is, is there a, an Azure offering that basically says, throw a load of horsepower at this, I'm happy to pay for it, but then obviously once the training's done, you know, you, you shut it down. Answer that one, then. Uh, yeah, so uh, as we saw in the model builder GUI, um, you can choose to train in Azure, essentially. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I assume at that point you would then link to your subscription and things like that, and it creates sort of like ML.net workspace for you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can definitely do that if you're finding that your training time uh, is extrapolating massively. Yeah, it's interesting, the ML. Lot, I mean, that's why I asked about how much time you were giving it, because the edge impulse it was cr absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. The more time I gave it to train the model, the better model I get. But with ML, it just starts learning. Just like the half of 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Any other questions? When you did your example, where the car was new and it didn't say you were at it, presumably you all end up back around the side of the Is it categorizing that? When I did the live demo? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was categorizing me as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that was in that, in that camera frame. So yeah, you know, if my nose sort of like shines the wrong way, I could start looking like an apple, maybe. Is, is it using other people's data as well as your own? So it's using transfer learning. So there is a, a very mature object detection um, neural network sitting in the background somewhere, but it doesn't know specifically about apples. Right. And that's why the training times are so low and it's so good at what it does. The end result of the model, how, how big is it? Can you put it on an IoT device as a standard? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. They're, they're tiny, right. they're kilobytes. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, a lot of edge impulse is about getting it on embedded devices, so uh, smallest many footprint apps as possible. So is, it, is there a, a problem where it starts becoming a neural network-based solution versus a linear algebra-based solution? It, Oh yeah, um, I I couldn't say what ML.net was doing when we built it. Um, I didn't need object detection in my oh, my cool. images yeah. were the objects. Mm. Whereas I think John needs to go a step further, find the boxes, and then what's in the box. Sure. Should we get up the top? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much. <laughs>